Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back from lunch. I trust that you had a, a nice lunch. Um, and I trust that you will stay awake. Um, not that we'll have uh, um, boring speakers. We actually have quite exciting um, topics coming up. So I don't want you to miss anything. Um, if I can just ask any, everyone just to move a bit closer, um, if, you, if you don't mind. Um, but we are going to start off with the second session in this um, first breakaway dealing with circular economy and life cycle management. In the first session or the first part this morning, we had presentations on circular economy. We shared a few perspectives from an Africa perspective, um, what's currently happening in the planning and policy space in South Africa, and also um, what's happening at the local government level. So um, we want to move on and uh, focus on what's been happening in the life cycle uh, management space. We have three exciting speakers that will share with us more information on uh, what's happening in that space from a company perspective, as well as from a research perspective. And uh, we will also hear some information on what's happening at a national level with regards to life cycle inventory and data collection. Um, so <clears throat> again, we will have the same format as we had earlier. We will have the speakers coming up and presenting. They will then take some questions towards the end of the session. And um, I sincerely hope that we will all walk out here with a lot more enthusiasm and excitement when it comes to life cycle management. So without further ado, I want to call on our first presenter. Um, he is from a company called Van Dyke Carpets. His name is Cyril Kumalo. Um, and he will pre be presenting on what the company has been doing um, from a, a life cycle assessment perspective, we will touch on that, but also on what they've been doing from a circular economy perspective. Um, thank you. Please give a round of applause to Cyril. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cyril. I'll be presenting our journey as Fandek Carpets from 2012 till 2019. In fact, on the environmental side, our journey started with SAPS, uh, ISO 14001 certification. And then from there, also in 2012, we went on to SGS, the greenhouse gas emission. <clears throat> the idea here was to try and see how we can control and measure the objective that we set up in ISO 14001. Because we looked at it and it was like, it's just a saying that we want to reduce this, we want to cut on this, but there wasn't really something that we can work on it that is changeable. Everyone can see that, okay. This is where we are now. This is where we worked for. And then from there, in 2015, we went for the carbon trust standard. And then in 2015, 2016, and 2017, we were engaged mainly with uh, NCPC for the implementation of ISO 50001. And then uh, last year and this year, we worked on LCA, and we've managed to get a final report which highlighted quite a number of things that we thought, because we have all these other like uh, measures, we're doing fine, but only to find that with our product itself, we're not at where, at where we thought we will be. Uh, before like going through the presentation, I would like to highlight a few names. First, my CEO, Dr. Meran Zarabini, reason being, I think without him, we wouldn't have gone this far. With his uh, encouragement, especially on sustainability, 
he managed to help and assist us in pushing everyone within the organization from the senior level to where we are at the floor to engage, be with us on all these initiatives. Uh, on the NCP side, uh, Henry Page, who introduced us to some of like, the projects that they offered and highlighted quite a number of things. And also within the organization, I can mention quite a few names. Uh, Melissa Pili, who were with us mainly with uh, ISO 50001. And also on the RECP program, we had uh, Oliver Stoko from Carbon and Energy Africa, and also not to forget our BDC plant engineer, Mr. Chris Narensama. Uh, on the highlights of the NCPC projects, we started in 2012-2013 with the RECP assessment where they highlighted quite a number of uh, opportunities that we need to work on. I just highlighted a few here, which was the optimization of airflow and heat input in the space dye and packing plant stands at the finishing line. And also they highlighted the replacement of motors with high efficiency motors and the need to have uh, adjustable speed drives. And also the automatic life controls and one of the major uh, recommendations that they highlighted is that we develop a management system for the organization. And then right after that in 2015 we went on with uh, ENMS and then in, in 2015 to 2017 we had another project that was conducted also by Melissa for our compressed air. On what was highlighted there on the LX, we had more than 300 LX in the plant. Looking at it, we looked at what was proposed to us and we looked at what we can save. Within a space of six months, the CEO agreed to change from these uh, old ones to the new compressor. And from there, we managed to save in uh, about 72,000 kilowatt hours. And then last year, and this year we managed to achieve our FCA assessment. And then on the employee side, employee empowerment. Uh, currently we have 28 employees that have been trained on beginner's level by the NCPC. We have two experts in ENMS and two also, I will say, experts in ENPIs. With the Compress Air, we have two employees trained and we hope to have two more employees at the expert level. And then with life cycle management, which was conducted by Zupedia as well, we had uh, 25 employees trained. And then on LCA, we have uh, two employees trained at an advanced level and nine employees at a beginner's level. Uh, our journey in 2012, this was mainly the idea that come up with our CEO after brainstorming on how we can like measure the objective that we set on ISO 14001. It came to a point that we need to go for assessment on greenhouse air gas emissions. So we had to set up our inventory, let them go and verify it. So just a brief on our scope. You can see scope two is the measure, one of which that is mainly electricity and steam. And then on scope one, it's a uh, high star uh, gas, LPGs, paraffin. And then on scope three, which is more indirect, we had the, the air flights, we had the goods transports. And when you, we look at the summary from 2012, you can see that we managed to drop our greenhouse gas emissions by almost 60%. And something interesting, if you look at 2014, from 2013 to 2012 to 2013, we dropped by 40, 14%, and then 2018 to 2014 by 8%. And then in 2015, 
we couldn't drop that much. We dropped by 10%. And then 20, between 2015 and 2016, a lot happened there. And we managed to drop by 21%. Of which the, in 2016 is where we implemented most of the recommendations that we highlighted on the RACP assessment. Looking at this at on scope two on, on its own, mainly electricity and steam, you can see there as well, we managed to drop by almost uh, 55 to 60%. Uh, in 2015, we went for carbon trust uh, certification, of which this was also a big achievement. We were the first uh, company in Africa to be certified for carbon under the carbon trust standard. Uh, we were verified against one of the organizations in our sector, in which is the best internationally and we achieved 19.6% compared to them at 20.6%. And then here yeah, they highlighted the areas that really we needed to improve on. When you look at the summary there, the best organization is at 75, we at 74. The areas that they highlighted we need to focus on were mainly procurement and then uh, policy of our organization and then look further into products and our services. Uh, in 2015, 2015, 2016, 2017, we worked on the energy management system, which was quite a challenging one. We had to go through a number of trainings we have to ensure that most of our staff can understand the language that the energy team is using, because at first we found that mainly the guys at the top don't understand really what we are talking about, especially when it comes to presenting to them. At first, years back, we've been using the SECs, and then when you come to them and present this, they will tell you that, no, 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 you can't say you're performing because really there you're not performing. So slowly we had to engage them on this and we ended up involving the NCCP, NPCP with their consultant to come and like train mainly at a higher level, get the guys to understand really what's going on. But also, as I mentioned earlier with our CEO, who's keen on all these things, he was there and the rest of the team, the senior team, was uh, motivated because they can see the leader of the organization is with us, is doing training, is attending the energy management meetings as well. So in 2014, 2015 to 2016, we had uh, quite a lot of savings. In fact, we saved more than 2.5 million kilowatt hours. And this was mainly due to the projects that or suggestions that were highlighted by NCPC on the RECP uh, assessment, of which contributed a lot also on our greenhouse gas emission uh, verification for the same year. Mm. I know we can't clearly see, but these are all the projects that were implemented from period of 2014 to 2016. And in 2018 to the current year, we engaged with uh, NCPC again on life cycle assessment. On this one, we picked one of our products, which is a, a fiber bonded bitumen back uh, capital. Reason being, this is one of the most like selling products that we had. So we want, wanted to go through, see really how we can like advance it in the market in terms of like eco-labeling as well. Uh, at the top, this is our like boundary. We looked at the materials from the supplier side 
and then to manufacturing, distribution, end user, and disposal. These are our like, products. This is the details of uh, our products uh, as well. Uh, what was also interesting, we've been doing uh, greenhouse gas emission. Really, on what we are focusing on in terms of the footprint, we were only focusing on CO2, the carbon footprint. Really, looking at this on the LCA, we found out there is there is quite a number of footprints that we were not really focusing on. And on the results from the assessment that was done, it was highlighted that more of the footprints or the impact to the environment is through the installation and use of our products and lately on the distribution and raw materials. And also with the carbon footprint, we can see that during manufacturing with uh, the, the bitumen, a bad uh, product, and the electricity used during manufacturing, that's where we get most of our uh, carbon uh, Im impact in terms of electricity, and also in the web forming and structuring of the product. And on the eco-efficiency side, it was highlighted that the total life cycle of the product costed us 189.7 cents. And also, it highlighted on the assessment on the left, there, on the right, that most of the impact was on installation and use. And when we look at it, due to installation and use, mainly it's because the assessment we did, most of our clients, they highlighted that they're cleaning our products on a daily basis, of which they're using uh, electricity for the vacuum, and on assessment that had a very high impact to the environment. And there were like suggestions that if they can reduce the cleaning times maybe into one time a week, one time a week, the, the impact can, can be reduced to 60%. And however, if cleaning is done one time per week, the eco-efficiency will be increased to 82%. Uh, these were some of uh, the recommendations that on our bitumen line, mainly we need to insulate the pipes that uh, support heat back and also running the bitumen line 24 hours. Because one of the challenges that we had, you need to preheat it for approximately 8 to 12 hours before running the line. And also that the company need to investigate more on procurement assessment so that we can understand what the suppliers are giving us in terms of formulation, the use of chemical substances, resources, and transport, among others. And lastly, it has also highlighted that as a way forward, the industry analysis highlighted an opportunity that can align the product to be eco-labeled under LCA. And further to that, in terms of uh, circular economy, the owners of the company started in 2011 looking at recycling some of uh, the products that we have in the landfill of which is waste the track from the tractors. And then their work was based on what is highlighted on South African uh, strategic objectives in terms of uh, recycling or land use dumped uh, tires. Looking at it on the performance indicators, uh, the audited performance in 2014 to 2015, we didn't have anything. And then 2015, 2016, is highlight, it was highlighted that 42% of the total waste tires is being diverted from the landfill sites. 
And then 2016-2017, it was 19.2%. And with the target, the medium term targets from 2018 to 2019, was that 50% must be diverted from the landfill in 2019-2020, uh, 60%, and in 2020-21 must be 70%. And then on setting up these objectives, they highlighted that 2016-2017 uh, will be the baseline, which was 19.2%, uh, and then the annual target for the following year, which is 2018 to the current year, 50%, and they further break it down to quarterly uh, targets of 8%, 20%, 30%, and 50%. And then with most of these uh, tires that are dumped at the landfill, about 25% of them are mainly uh, truck tires. So, with this uh, in mind, in 2011, they spotted a small plant that was based uh, in Hammersdale KZN. They partnered with the owners of the organization, which was mainly 100% uh, black owned. And then in 2016, they invested almost 1.1 million uh, US dollars. And then they started uh, commencing operation in uh, 2016 and uh, 2017. And currently the company is one of the biggest tire recyclers in Africa. This, that's just uh, the team. This is uh, the company and the stats currently up to 2018. We've managed to manufacture 650, 6,500 tons of uh, the crumb from uh, 150,000 uh, tractors that have been recycled. And also, with the demand of this, currently we're looking at getting another plant the same size so we can like, afford to support uh, the market. Highlighted are some of uh, the applications. Uh, it's used for the filling of artificial tough football fields and athletics uh, tracks. Also, it's used for the bumper plates and also for ballistics in shooting ranges. Uh, it's also used as paving bricks and as floor slabs and also as solutions for staples. Hydra uh, Tide is one of the major, uh, one of the biggest market that we have in the moment, of which is the one that is pushing the owners of the organization to invest more, see how can we meet the demand in this uh, sector. And then if I can conclude, this is mainly from my CEO, where he highlights our close association with uh, NCPC over the past years, which resulted in a sustainable approach to manufacturing and a dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emission through energy efficiency interventions and we will continue to work closely with NCPC SA as key stakeholders as we progress towards implementing more environmentally sustainable and energy efficient projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril. Um, it's always nice to, to hear how, how the companies have taken up the, the different services of the NCPC and actually managed to make an impact in industry. Um, Van Dyke Carpets have been one of the 
um, companies that has really been supporting the NCPC and that's taking the lead in the sector um, to start making an impact um, on the environmental and sustainability front. Um, and they've also agreed to even further share with us a lot of the work that they've done and we hope to see towards the end of this year and early next year some more material and um, videos around um, how they are operating and actually how they're doing things behind the scenes. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we're still doing good for time. Um, we hope to get some time at the end for some questions. Um, but I would like to invite our next speaker to the podium. Our next speaker is from the CSIR. Um, his name is Dr. William Stafford. Um, he's principal researcher um, in the CSIR, and he will be um, talking to us a bit uh, today about um, what's happening in the shopping bag space, plastic bag space, um, specifically from a life cycle perspective. Thank you, Dr. Stafford. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so I'm going to be discussing with you today a one-year project, a case study, if you like, looking at the life cycle sustainability assessment of shopping bags available at supermarkets in South Africa. So hopefully you've noticed that there's a growing concern over plastics and a bunch of alternative materials are appearing on our shelves. So if you look at the shopping bags um, available at your retail supermarkets, you might notice um, several additions. Um, aside from the usual HDPE uh, carrier bags, the polyethylene carrier bags, um, we're seeing a comeback in the brown craft paper bags. We're also seeing a bunch of other more reusable options. For example, you can see the um, polypropylene bags, uh, woven polypropylene, which can be used several times. We've got the polyester bags, fibrous polyester bags made from pet recycled bottles. And we're starting to see bioplastics coming in the market. So plastics either produced from bio-based materials or produced from petrochemical materials which are compostable or biodegradable. So briefly, the problem with plastics, obviously we've had a huge consumption in plastics consumption and use. Um, so we're talking about 400 million tons per annum currently, and it's been growing obviously since the industrial revolution, if you like. Um, at around about 4% per year, the annual growth. <clears throat> and currently, the, it accounts for about 4 to 8% of our fossil fuel, fuel use. So, of course, plastics are petroleum products, and they come from petroleum. Um, the big benefit of plastic is, in fact, that they're durable. So they're durable and, and seen as cost-effective, easy to process, and, of course, impervious or impermeable to water and air, which makes them very beneficial for storage and packaging. And this has enabled a whole range of different uses which weren't possible before. But of course, um, that benefit of being durable is in fact also some of the downfall, if you like, of plastics. Plastics are very persistent. So once used and discarded, they persist in the environment. Um, so plastics might take anything from decades to hundreds or if not thousands of years to degrade, depending on the, the receiving environment. Obviously, if they're in compost or soil, or floating around in the cold marine environment or underneath a landfill, the degradation is going to differ. But we're talking about really long periods of time for conventional plastics. And essentially the problem is that many of these plastics are single use. So they're not seen as durable products. They're used singly, if you think about takeaway foods, for example, just minutes or hours after we've consumed the product, the food, those plastics are thrown away. So because plastics are accumulating, in fact, the burden on the environment is, in, is accumulating. So we're talking about about 4,900 million tons globally of plastics that are slowly accumulating in, in, in the environment because they're not breaking down. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the, the biodegradation of plastic is really slow. Microbes degrade them incredibly slowly, decades, hundreds, if not thousands of years for some plastics. And they do actually break down, but a lot, a lot of the breakdown you're seeing is physical breakdown. So they're breaking down into small particles, microplastics or microfibers. And of course, the big concern with these plastics entering the environment is their effect or their impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems. In fact, what we may call plastic pollution. So plastic pollution is obviously how plastics impact terrestrial, aquatic, and marine biota and ecosystems. 
And in fact, um, a study not so long ago ranked South Africa as 11th in the world for the mismanagement of plastic waste. And this is calling Department of Environmental Affairs and other agents to think about a ban on single-use plastics. And in fact, many other countries around the world have done that. But we need to think carefully about this problem. So is the problem really with plastics? Or is it somehow due to people's behavior? Or is it actually something broader, like our actual waste management system that isn't really appropriate? And if we're not to use plastics, what are the alternatives? What are the suitable alternatives out there which can replace our plastic products? And how do these products actually compare from an environmental perspective, but also actually probably from a social and economic perspective too? So what we're really looking for, what we really need, is some kind of assessment method or approach which includes the environmental, social, and economic impacts of plastic bags and also the alternatives um, in order to inform appropriate and effective decision making. So life cycle assessment is one such tool. It's obviously based on an ISO standard and it's most commonly applied solely to the environmental realm. So it's commonly thought of in, as environmental life cycle assessment. And of course it considers raw material, production, use, or manu uh, production, manufacture, use, um, disposal and end of life, the, the whole life cycle of the product that we need to consider in this type of assessment. But going beyond the environmental sphere, if we want to do a more holistic type of assessment, we obviously need to include the economic and social spheres as well. So that type of assessment would be called um, life cycle sustainability assessment, whereby it actually tries to address um, the social, the environmental, social, and economic aspects into what would be called life cycle sustainability assessment. So the aim and goals of our work in this project, so we're basically building our capacity within the CSR um, to carry out life cycle sustainability assessment, and we're building our expertise currently in life cycle assessment and getting to grips with the, the software. We're currently um, carrying that out and, and uh, building our capacity. And we're applying this knowledge or this tool set that we're hoping to build in, in terms of life cycle sustainability assessment to this particular case study at, at, as the outset, um, looking at different carrier bag options available in South Africa, and hopefully we want to apply this to a range of other products that consumers or industry might be interested in developing to try and inform the decision what's the best choice from a sustainability perspective. So the goal, in fact, of this case study or of this project is to compare the performance of different types of carrier bags currently offered by South African retailers in terms of sustainability across the product's life cycle. So if we think about the different alternatives to plastics which might be available, as I mentioned, there's both bio-based and biodegradable plastics. And these are two distinct aspects or characteristics, and they sometimes do overlap, but not necessarily. So if we look here, we can see a bunch of conventional plastics you might be familiar with, HDPE, LDP, polyester, polypropylene, a lot of those petroleum-based bags. They're largely sitting here, non-biodegradable, and sitting down here, petro-based. Okay? There's a lot of initiatives to drop in bio-based chemicals and produce plastics which are essentially exactly the same as this, but come from bio-based resources. So one such product on the shelf you might have already seen is the plant bottle, um, which Valpair are selling their water in and Woolworths are selling their milk, and that is bio-based. It's basically coming from PET, and the ethanol which goes into that PET is coming from sugarcane, so it's coming from a bio-based resource. But it's totally non-biodegradable, just as much as the conventional plastic. On the other side, if you like, when you look at the biodegradables, we've got what you might consider or know as fully biodegradable, for example, our paper, and then we've got some new interesting bioplastic type products coming on the market, for example, polylactic acid or polylactides, which are biodegradable, but some somewhat hard to biodegrade. They might need industrial composting, um, composting conditions. And um, then there's, in fact, also several other types of materials which aren't bio-based, but they are, in fact, biodegradable. So you can get biodegradable materials which come from fossil fuel resources. So 
there's this clear distinguishment between bio-based and biodegradable resources. And in some cases, such as paper, they're obviously both bio-based and biodegradable, but for others, they're not. So the, end, uh, the, the bottom line is that not all biodegradable bags are in fact bio-based. I mentioned that some of them, for example, can come from fossil fuel resources and are still biodegradable. And not all bio-based bags are in fact biodegradable, or at least easily. So one good example is the polylactic acid, and that really needs good composting conditions, industrial composting conditions. Otherwise, it's quite difficult to break down. So sitting in the cold marine oceans, it's still going to take a considerable long time to break down. It's not readily biodegradable. So as I mentioned, we're comparing these different bag options, and what you may have already noticed is when you carry your shopping in these different bags is that not all bags are the same. So for a start, the bags carry different volumes, and the bags have different weight-bearing capacities. Um, some are a lot stronger than others and a lot more durable. As you can imagine, the ones designed to be reused many times are, of course, designed to be a lot more durable. So we have to somehow adjust for a functional unit to make sure that we adjust um, each bag type to make sure that they are assessed in the same way. So the functional unit that we use for a baseline comparison is, of course, our standard shopping bag. So this is our HDPE, conventional shopping bag, which is single use, although, of course, many people may use it several times or have a secondary use from it. And it's defined as being able to carry groceries um, from the supermarket to the home with an average capacity in terms of volume of 24 liters and an average weight bearing capacity of 12 kilograms. And then all the other bag options that we're considering, um, which are listed here, um, are those ones which I've highlighted earlier. So we're looking at our polypropylene, polyester bags, and then some of our bioplastics, such as PBS, uh, PBS and PBAT, um, the craft paper, the LDPE, um, and uh, some other bag types, for example, the HDPECM, which has got a chemical compound to accelerate the, the breakdown of that plastic. So all those different bag types need adjusting in terms of their different weight um, loading capacity and their different volume loading capacity. And once we've done that, they're essentially on an equal footing to make sure that we can compare them. And then we're basically assessing the material flows. All the materials going into manufacturing that bag which supplies that functional unit will give us an idea of the impacts associated with that bag's manufacture. So of course in, in life cycle assessment we normally consider the inputs and outputs into our system or our boundary which typically consists of extraction of raw materials, transport to the manufacturing plant, production of the shopping bag, transport to the supermarket, um, use by the customer, eventual disposal and sending to landfill or littering waste disposal, basically. So we're thinking about the material, water, and energy inputs and the outputs, which of course give rise to impact categories and damage. And this would be our typical environmental um, life cycle. So in terms of framing our thinking, um, obviously you see that a lot of bags have recycled content. So even the HDPE bags, you'll notice some of them have 100% recycled content, for example, the checkers bag, in fact, are certified to have 100% recycled content. Others may have varying degrees of recycled content. So recycling is obviously going to help. It's going to retrieve those materials and enable somewhat of a recovery of those materials um, back. So it's going to save new materials having to be mined or new fossil fuel resources having to be mined. But of course, what happens in, in recycling is that Recycling also comes at a cost. It comes at a cost both financially, but also in terms of water, energy, and materials. So the actual recycling infrastructure is also going to give rise to impacts. So yes, recycling is going to help, but it's also going to give rise to perhaps traditional impacts, and it can only recover some, not all, of those materials. If, on the other hand, we consider reuse, reuse is, in fact, a lot better, because reuse completely avoids the need for another bag. Um, we don't need extra energy basically involved in that reuse of that bag, and thereby reuse completely avoids the impacts by substituting the need for a better bag. So people have asked me before, what is the best bag option? And I'm not going to be able to tell you that today because our study isn't in fact concluded, but if I was to tell you, it's probably to try and keep using the bag that you have now because reuse is in fact one of the best options. So, of course, as you're probably aware of in, in um, life cycle assessments, <clears throat> we're looking at the outputs, 
from these materials going into our manufacture, our whole life cycle, and those are assessed in terms of impact categories and impact endpoints. Um, so we have a whole range of different impact categories, uh, some of which you might well be quite familiar with, and they're listed here in terms of point, uh, midpoints, and then what would normally happen is you'd come up with your damage and your endpoints, which would basically give you a measure in terms of total human health, um, ecosystems or environmental health, and for example, resource depletion. So there's been a lot of work, in fact, in standardizing these impact assessment methodologies and coming up with uh, databases in lifecycle assessment software um, to make sure that these are basically rigorous and coherent. Of course, the plastic pollution, and I'll come to that a bit more later, isn't one of these impact categories as yet. So that's a notable research gap. But the main point being is that there's a whole range of different impact categories, and we might need to trade some of these off. So one product might be better in terms of a greenhouse gas footprint, a carbon footprint, and the other might be better in terms of impact on water or eutrophication effects. And then if that wasn't difficult enough, that we've got to, in fact, trade off different impacts associated with a product, environmental impacts, I mentioned we also have to try and integrate the social and economic aspects too. So we're not just considering these environmental type of impacts that you might well be familiar with, but we're also thinking about some social type of indicators that we want to look at in terms of job skills and disamenities, for example, what is plastic litter due to the, the quality of our beaches, for example, or our recreational resorts, and also the economic aspects. So we need to think about um, value adding, economic value adding, import substitution, and the services. Do we really want to spend money tidying up waste and, and doing those kind of services? Is it a real good economic benefit? So those are the type of indicators we also want to include in our, in our life cycle sustainability assessment. So I'm just going to go through very quickly uh, the framework or the, the basically the models that we're going to be utilizing um, in our life cycle assessment software, going through the different bag options. I mentioned we've got high density polyethylene. That's the thin option of 24 microns. That's our conventional plastic bag. <clears throat> and of course, it's relying on on fossil fuel resources as raw materials, and it has got quite a considerable amount of recycling. There's also the thicker HDPE bag coming in now, so a lot more reusable, also high density polyethylene, but now 17 microns thick, obviously a similar life cycle. We've got a high density polyethylene with an ECM additive. So this is a proprietary additive which has caused a lot of controversy in the United States because it basically accelerates the breakdown to microplastics. It doesn't increase biodegradation, it just helps that plastic break down into microparticles, which may or may not be a good thing. Certainly we don't know what microplastics do largely in terms of environmental impacts, so it could actually be quite a bad thing. But of course breaking down plastics physically is one of the steps which helps microbes access that plastic resource to accelerate its breakdown. So it may in fact help. But it's a very controversial product, and in fact, I think in, in the EU, it's largely been, been banned. It's largely been not considered. So then there's the low-density polyethylene, very similar to HDP, coming from fossil fuel resources. Um, we've got the woven polypropylene bags. So you might have seen those often with very colorful printed pattern on the front. So again, coming from fossil fuel resources, polypropylene, but it's a woven product. And of course, also a recycling stream for polypropylene. We've got the fibrous uh, bags, the polyester bags, um, spun fiber largely. Um, these are coming from polyester or PET bottles. So in fact, that uh, water bottle or those clear bottles get recycled and get incorporated into those um, our PET recycled PET polyester bags. So that what that uh, product life cycle would look like. Then of course, we've got the, the craft paper, the conventional brown paper that's obviously making quite a comeback and people are adding sort of waterproofing layers to that to make it more durable. It of course comes not from fossil fuel resources, but from biological resources, from forestry in fact. So it comes from our forestry industry. And of course there, in addition to recycling, it's got another useful end of life and that would be the composting stream. Then we've got some quite interesting bioplastic options. 
So we've got PBS or polybutylene succinate, which is being mixed with PBAT. Um, <clears throat> so currently, these chemicals are, in fact, coming from largely coming from petroleum resources, but they are biodegradable. So this is a bioplastic product, which is petroleum-based, but uh, fully biodegradable. And of course, it would then have an end-of-life stream as being suitable for composting. Uh, another bioplastic is polylactic acid, or PLA. So the first generation PLA will almost certainly come from maize. Uh, maize starch would be the raw material there. And again, since it's um, compostable and biodegradable, it would have a composting end of life. And I think uh, lastly is polybutylene adap adaptate uh, terephthalate, um, PBAT, which is also being mixed in one of the bag options made from HMRP with starch. So we've got a PBAT plus starch mix. So that's quite complicated. The PBAT is coming from a fossil fuel resource, and the starch is obviously coming from a biological resource. Both of them are fully compostable and biodegradable, and therefore the end of life there would have also a suitable composting stream. So we've done some work uh, in terms of looking at the types of impacts in the literature and, and scoping um, previous work, and we see that quite amazingly a lot of the impacts um, depend substantially on the raw materials. So a lot of the carbon footprint, footprint, for example, of plastic products such as HDPE depends substantially on the fact that it comes from ethylene, which originally comes from oil. So 80% of the impacts, in fact, of HDPE, the, the carbon impacts, can be attributed to raw material production, basically oil. And this impact is made worse or exacerbated in South Africa, in fact, because a lot of the oil that we use for our plastic, in fact, comes from the Sassel coal to liquids process. And that's very energy intensive and quite a dirty process. So in fact, it makes our plastics, if you like, our HDP, quite a lot more energy intensive and dirtier than, for example, Euro European plastics, which would be coming from natural gas. So <clears throat> that's something additionally worth to consider. The raw materials, particularly for the petroleum-based products, are going to be responsible for a large portion of the, the impacts, particularly the carbon impacts. But on the other side of the coin, the bio-based resources aren't totally free of impacts, and we, we know that, for example, the production of some of those bio-based resources, such as maize, uh, they require land and fertilizer and water, and those are relatively constrained resources in South Africa, and they could also compete with other production, for example, food, because of course maize is used for food. So there could be certain conflicts around food versus plastics, uh, bioplastics, if you like. Um, and of course, those bio-based resources and those farming methods also aren't devoid of impacts. So the carbon emissions as a result of the artificial fertilizer use and the tillage, for example, would or could be quite substantial. So I mentioned that the impacts are obviously strongly influenced by the raw materials, but they also seem to be quite strongly influenced by the end of life or what happens uh, at, disposal, at disposal of the product. So <clears throat> we've obviously got reuse, recycling and disposal, and disposal um, is what happens at the end of life. And it is in a circular economy, one would hope that there is in fact no waste and that every end of life product can be reincorporated into some new use and that would be a real true circular economy. In South Africa, what happens to a large amount of our waste, in fact, all our waste just about, um, in terms of plastics, is it's landfilled, um, and that's not the current practice in some other countries. For example, in Europe, they incinerate a lot of their waste and plastics. We choose to landfill ours. But in South Africa, we also know that about only 60% of our wastes are collected, so there's also a large portion of the South African community, which don't have their waste connected. <clears throat> and in addition to that, it's, it's only really the big landfill sites in the metros which are fully compliant. So only about a third of our landfill sites are estimated to be fully compliant with legislation in terms of being managed properly and, and covered and also having um, <clears throat> a liner to prevent leachate. So that's our current status of our waste collection. We don't have a full waste collection service and we only have a portion, a third of our waste uh, landfills compliant. And our recycling rate uh, is also relatively low. Recycling isn't going to save the day completely. As I mentioned earlier, it's definitely gonna help. And our currently net recycling rate of plastics is about 16%. So about 16% of our plastics um, will go into new plastic materials, new, um, 
recyclates. So um, some work done by Prof. Harif von Botnitz at UCT has looked at the material flows of plastics in South Africa to try and shed some light on this issue because there's a lot of controversy going on in terms of waste management and plastics. So we see that in any given year, this is 2017, there's about 1,808 kilotons of plastics flowing in our system uh, or being consumed. Uh, plastic bags, the actual carrier bags, if you like, um, are about 2.9 billion in 2017. So that's uh, based on the plastic bag levy, and it's actually probably an underestimate because not all plastic bags are levied. There's a big informal industry, if you like, and a lot of plastic bags aren't levied. But at least there's 2.9 billion plastic bags being consumed, which is quite a lot, and that's in fact about 2% of the total plastics consumption in South Africa. So the plastic bag is obviously only a portion of the plastic consumption, but I think quite a significant one. And then also what's quite a surprise is that the actual littering aspect, we get, a, I think, an impression that littering is causing a lot of the plastic floating around in the environment. But it seems that the direct littering is only a relatively small portion. Only about 1% of the total plastics ends up being littered. However, there seems to be a lot of leakage coming from the landfill sites. So as I mentioned, only about a third of the landfill sites are adequately managed. So that means two-thirds aren't. And if we do a rough estimate looking at how much plastic is likely to leak or be wind blown into the environment from those managed sites, saying that about 80% of the plastic from self-help sites, so those are people which don't have landfill services and they make their own plan basically, obviously a lot of people in rural settings, about 80% of that leaches into the environment, about 30% from deficient landfills, i.e. landfills which don't fully comply, leaches into the environment, and only about 1% from you know, fully compliant landfills leach into the environment. We get about 25% uh, of the total plastic is currently leaking into the environment, which is, of course, quite a lot, and it maybe reflects on what we're actually seeing in the environment, which is quite a mess. And in fact, some of the international reports, as I mentioned at the outset, saying that we're about 15th in the world in terms of the mismanagement of plastic. So a lot of the picture is pointing at how we dispose of our plastics and also the management of our landfills and our waste services. And, and in fact, choosing landfill as a disposal option instead of incineration in South Africa. So I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a notable research gap in, in life cycle assessment in terms of not having a good understanding of the plastic pollution story. And of course, this is what society is largely concerned about. It's seeing the impacts on wildlife and biota, seeing turtles being strangulated by six packs and plastic bags, and it's becoming really concerned. And that, that pressure is um, you know, pointing towards where's the science between plastic, uh, behind plastic pollution? How, you know, how important is plastic pollution compared to all the other type of environmental impacts? Like carbon footprint or eutrophication, for example. So there's in fact no established um, impact method in the LCA software or databases to assess plastic pollution. And this is in fact part of a huge global effort to try and get a better handle on this aspect, plastic pollution. So there's a, in fact a Mendelin declaration, um, basically highlighting the problem with plastic pollution and trying to get a global initiative to focus on that aspect and you can sign that declaration if, if you like. I'd encourage you to do so. And there's a global MARI LCA, or uh, a Marine Litter Impacts in LCA initiative, which by I think 2020 or 2025 hopes to incorporate ma marine litter into LCA software, together with the associated databases and impact categories. So in summary, I can basically tell you now that um, I'm gonna finish this work at the end of the year and hopefully be able to deliver a coherent picture of which is the most sustainable plastic bag option and why. But at the moment I can say from scoping the impacts it looks as though the resource extraction is responsible for a large portion of those impacts and we're talking about you know, growing maize or sugarcane for those bioplace plastics for example that would carry quite a lot of the impacts or mining fossil fuels and, and going from coal to produce oil to produce many of those plastic type products and that will carry a lot of the carbon emissions and environmental footprints. And then the other hot spot is at the end of the life cycle, uh, basically the end of life and disposal, where we're looking at our waste management systems, both in terms of collection 
and also in terms of how to manage those landfill sites better and make sure that they are indeed compliant. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. William Stafford. Um, we're looking forward to hear what you conclude at the end of the year. Um, very interesting indeed, and I think it definitely starts getting us to think about our behavior. Um, next time we go to the shops and uh, walk out with, with a lot of shopping bags. Um, we're going to have our last presentation now. Um, it's going to be um, focusing on a bit broader uh, subject of data, um, life cycle inventory in South Africa, um, and specifically, and as uh, Dr. Stafford just mentioned, um, the data for marine plastics hopefully will also be introduced into these uh, software programs. Um, but the importance of that is quite critical for us to get a true reflection of the environmental impact when we do LCAs at the South African level. Um, so our next presenter is Dr. Pippa Notten. Um, she will be presenting on, on the life cycle databases and inventory. And um, yeah, I think we are running on time. So um, thank you very much. Please give her a round of applause. Hi, good afternoon. Um, hope you can hear me. My mic's on. My magic. Really good tech in this place. <laughs> yes, so my, I guess, coming third is a good thing in that now you've had a really great um, LCA case study to get your head into LCA. And this, um, what I'm talking about particularly, is the data that we need to do LCA studies. Um, and particularly, oh, let me go to my yeah, first slide. So, I sort of broke this into three distinct topics. The middle one was really, this so number two is this roadmap for developing a national LCA database. So in order to do LCAs, we need the data. So that's the main um, topic of, of, of my talk. But and then in order to do that, I thought I'd better first maybe back up and make sure everybody knew what lifecycle inventory was and pretty much to make the case of why do we need a national LCI database, which, as I said, does make it slightly easier coming third because I think now we've, we've seen an application of life cycle assessment and perhaps why we do need it. And then the third um, component of, of my talk is around some data sets that we already have and, and how we could use these to start the ball rolling on a national LCA database. So as I said, backing up first, I'm not sure of the, the knowledge of this audience. Uh, the topics life cycle management um, and circular economy, all related topics. And you'll see that even in my initial slide there, I kept on mixing LCI and LCA. And it can all be a bit confusing, LCM, life cycle management, as to what all these acronyms and things actually are. So this is the picture that you often see for life cycle assessment. I liked um, William's linear one, because in truth, we really do deal with linear value chains at this stage. But the aspirational picture of LCA is always to have this um, circular system, which is sort of fits in quite well with circular economy, which is why LCA and circular economy are fairly um, compatible bedfellows. Oh, sorry, I went too far. Um, the sort of circular economy, but life cycle assessment would really be around providing the, the quantitative, so circular economy is maybe the aspiration, life cycle assessment is all around providing the actual numbers and the data and, and the metrics um, for, for circular economy. This picture, um, very much similar to, to the linear value chain, but the idea is in a life cycle assessment, you want to take the full product value chain into account. So you start with your, uh, that's why I'm going wrong, my, there we go. You start with raw materials, which as um, with the plastics often are where the big uh, impact lies, but you need to follow your life cycle all the way through because quite often it's actually counterintuitively perhaps in the use phase, which I thought was a really fascinating um, thing for the carpets, who would have thought that it's vacuuming your carpet where a lot of your impact lies. So similarly with things like cars, which we well know, 
the use phase is often your biggest um, impact area. So the whole idea of LCA is really having this whole product value chain from what we call cradle to grave. Ideally, we want a circular system with no particular grave, but in, in, in reality, we have um, material going out to disposal, and hopefully we have a lot of reuse going on in our, our circle. So as I said, life cycle assessment is really around the um, quantitative part of it. So life cycle, maybe just to explain the acronyms, life cycle management is the umbrella tool, whereas life cycle assessment is the quantitative sub-tool of life cycle management. And it's really a model um, of all the product, of a, all the materials and energy that goes into a product or service primarily product, we talk about product LCA, but it could equally be um, providing a service, uh, let's say, so with the carpeting, um, your product is carpeting, but you could also reframe that as, as some um, companies do these days and sell you a flooring service, in which case they'll come back and take it away, remanufacture it and bring it back, because what you want is the, the nice floor in your apartment, not necessarily the actual carpet. So. It's broad enough to try and, and encompass products and services. Important, so it goes around um, quantifying all those material and energy flows, all the inputs, all the outputs across that whole value chain. And then it takes it one step further, which is to actually model the consequence of those flows on our health, the health of ecosystems, on human health, um, the health of ecosystems, and also on the availability of resources. So it's really what are we concerned about and we want to model those impacts. A key feature is this cradle to grave nature. Um, and um, again, coming nicely after William really talked about the whole idea of both environmental and socioeconomic impacts to be taken into account. So it's really uh, very um, ambitious, uh, but you need to do that because you want to improve entire systems and not just single parts of systems. So the whole idea of life cycle assessment is you don't just fix something that's perhaps happening at your, on your factory where it actually, by changing uh, raw materials, that you may be creating a bigger impact uh, somewhere else within your, life, within your product value chain. So you want to avoid decisions that sort of fix one problem and, but just cause another unexpected environmental problem. Um, so you can see it's used uh, particularly both in policy support. So if you're a government and you wanted to devise policy, you want to be making sure that whatever policy you're putting into place is actually making a difference and improving things and not just merely making it worse somewhere else. Or it can be used within industry. Eco-design is a popular application. So if you want to, to design a new product, you want to change your materials, or as a product designer, you often, if you don't, more and more there's the, the idea that you actually need to take your use phase into account, because often that's the longest time period where the biggest impacts, they may be um, small, but then they're cumulative over a 20 year lifespan of a product. So when you're a designer, you're thinking, if you're already thinking of your product use phase, you actually can minimize the um, full environmental impacts of your, of your product or system. So that's life cycle assessment, but as you can imagine, it requires lots of data. So it's really a, a data-driven model. This is just an example, so rather put a picture rather than just talk of things in, in the abstract. Um, this is a relatively simple life cycle model of a beef steak, steak that lands on your plate at a braai. Uh, but it's going to go through all these, these value chain steps, starting with your farm and then going right down through your sort of um, slaughtering and a processing, so some sort of plant and a you know, distribution retail until it lands up at, at your plate. So that's what I'm saying a, a sort of a life cycle system would be. When you're doing a study, uh, you may well be, say, I don't know, the, the people actually making the steak. So perhaps you're sitting there as a meat processor you, have, you may or may not know your suppliers, but generally in a life cycle study, you concentrate on what we call the foreground. Um, you would go talk to perhaps the people who, where you're getting your cattle from, where they're sourcing their cattle from, and you can go and do material and energy balances, you know, find out their electricity that they use. It's a lot of data collection, but it's sort of doable, and that's what a life cycle study is. A lot of sort of grunt work of going to talk and getting to know your suppliers, it's actually one of its key outcomes is a really 
um, integrated supply chains and you kind of actually learn a lot just by going to talk to your suppliers. Where the difficult part comes in is all these things on the left-hand side here, because if you're the, the wanting to do the study here, you also don't want to go out and do life cycle assessments on electricity and on water supply and on all the fuels, the, the diesel used in the trucks and distribution, the, the LPG used in your um, machinery in, the, in your lift, lifters and your distribution center. You don't want to go and do LCAs on all agri chemicals coming in, so fertilizers and pesticides. You probably don't also want to go and do a whole LCA on plastic packaging or whatever other packaging you, you're doing for your, for your uh, steak. So there's a huge amount, and there's also on the end of your life, so we want to, you know, in a full LCA, you need to include uh, the end of life. So you also want, don't want to go and do uh, whole studies on waste disposal, landfilling, um, so there's a huge amount of data that sits and underpins an LCA study, which we call the background data. And generally, this is the data you draw from an LCA database. So if you want to do an LCA study, you do not want to go around then and doing, um, you know, visiting each one of ESCOM's power stations and perhaps the new PV solar plants and all of that. So it's, it's ridiculous. It would make it unworkable. So what happened in the rest of the world is life cycle databases, which is all great for people that, um, you know, if you're not South African, but our electricity, our, our, our fuel is pretty unique, and um, pulling it straight from a, a European database does not necessarily or at all give you very good or um, robust life cycle uh, results for South Africa. So this idea of LCA database, and they really grew up with the, the field of LCA in terms of actually just making it a workable um, assessment tool. Uh, this is a bit of a technical sl slide, but just to um, get some of these ideas of lifecycle inventory from, from lifecycle database. So a lifecycle database stores what we call lifecycle inventory. So let me actually just go back to this one. When you make a, an LCA, you tend you have all these individual blocks that I spoke about. So each one of these we would call a unit process, and each one has material flows and energy going out and waste products and um, emissions. Those all individually are what we call life cycle inventory. So they, each one is a data set, and when you add them all up together, then they become a life cycle assessment. So that's the between sort of the LCI and the LCA. So when we talk of an LCA database, it's to do LCAs, but what you need is a collection of LCIs, these building blocks, which we can then combine up to make our LCA. So just drawing that distinction, a database is a, a set of LCI data sets. Um, and really important is this idea that if you have a database, if you want to do a good LCA model, you have to have consistent LCIs. You can't sort of grab LCIs from various places. Um, you need them that they need to, to conform to a common set of methodological criteria. So if anyone's tried to do LCA, there's quite a lot of choices that inevitably get done, system boundaries, and I didn't want to make this too technical a talk, but you can get really um, crazy results, wrong results, if you just grab data from all over the place. And uh, the idea of a database is that it's giving you reviewed, consistent data sets that can reliably be combined up together uh, to, to make a good, um, sound result for an LCA result. In a database, the other thing to um, bear in mind is the second half of LCA, which is where you, where you then ex take it on, and there were some good slides, thank you. <laughs> uh, William, for all those LCIA slides, those are all impact categories. That's what comes next. Um, you put that onto your life cycle inventory data and you get your LCA results. So when you have an LCA database, you want your uh, flow names and everything to map properly onto impact assessment names. So you've got to have those other models that people develop, but your data has to, to talk to that to make sense. So it gets a bit technical, uh, but it is really important. So that's what a nice, consistent, useful LCA database that would make doing an LCA study uh, relatively quick, uh, as quick and easy as an LCA study is ever going to be. Just in contrast, a uh, data set library is, there are a couple of these around, and this is often where you start maybe as a, as a country, 
is sort of ad hoc collections of life cycle data sets. So already in South Africa, we've actually been a, a LCA research community for a good 20 years or so. So there are all sorts of masters, uh, theses and PhDs that have been done, but no one's ever made, a, a, you may, within a university or maybe there's somebody has a set of them, that would be a library, a data set library, like a library of theses or something, but they haven't ever been put into any coherent or cohesive form. Um, and then a, a data hub is sort of a similar idea where it's taking a way of getting access to, to different uh, sources of life cycle data. And I'm going to talk a bit about one particularly that was involved in the project that I'm mainly talking about. That's called GLAD. Um, but that's slightly different in that it's, it's um, allowing you to access life cycle data. And there are a couple of those. There's the, the US Digital Commons, I think it's called. And there's a one called Open LCA Nexus, which collates a whole bunch of LCA data, but that's not consistent or reviewed or um, like, a, like a database would be. So just to make that distinction. Um, so those individual little building blocks uh, that I showed in the, um, the system diagram there was really just to show. So each one of those is where your material and energy balance starts, helps. So, is, so you have a reference product, and that's, uh, you'll have byproducts and all the emissions coming out of those individual data sets, the life cycle inventories. And they get rolled up, which is that big uh, boundary I drew around the outside, and there, once you've aggregated your results up into to what's called the final life cycle inventory, then you do the impact assessment and you get your LCA results. Okay. So why do we want one of these? Why a national LCA database? I think, you know, we've heard a lot this a circular economy um, and sustainable consumption and production, but really these are good, you know, you have, it's difficult actually to, to move these from concepts into to supporting actual decisions or moving towards um, sustainable consumption and production or towards circular economy without actually putting some numbers behind it. Um, so it's really uh, a cornerstone of sustainable consumption and production. And if you want to report on progress, you need some sort of data to underpin it. So I've just put the two of the, the SDGs there, but South Africa is committed to reporting on the SDGs, UN's Sustainable Development Goals and that requires data to underpin that. The same thing with evidence-based policy making. It sounds great, but you actually need the data to support the evidence. And currently, uh, LCA pol uh, policy makers in South Africa are hampered by the lack of reliable, um, just not it's just LCA data, but sort of environmental uh, data that covers South Africa's specific contexts and needs. So there are a lot of international data but when you start looking into it, South Africa has a number of very unique and different, so something that looks one way, an LCA study isn't actually something that is directly transferable, and I can give you lots of examples where a South African study comes up really quite differently to what a European study or what an American study came up with, largely because of our different, our very carbon intensive electricity, because of the way we uh, have landfill, we don't have incineration, we don't have energy recovery at, at end of life. So those things make a really big difference. So partly, you know, we need a database if we're going to do evidence-based policy making for our policymakers. But it's also not only that; it's also for, for industry um, to drive sustainable de um, production. And an LCA database helps grow capacity, not only in, in developing the data, which it certainly in the project that I'll, I'll quickly outline now it certainly did, because when you're doing it, you're learning and you're building capacity. But it also, once there is the data available, then it's more easy, easy for, for somebody to do an LCA study and build capacity that way as well. So onto the roadmap um, for developing a national LCA database. I'm running rather slow. I'll try and speed up. This was a project um, by, commissioned by the UN Environment, all these logos at the bottom, but it was, it's the Life Cycle Initiative, which is a unit that sits within the UN Environment um, in Paris, uh, which are sort of tasked with growing LCA globally. And the project was funded by the European Commission. 
actually have Dr. Sarah here. So under the, the real project called the Resource Efficiency Through Application of Life Cycle Thinking, so it's European Commission funded, but um, through the through UN Environment as the project commissioner. With the objective to develop national LCA databases in a number of different countries. Um, and I also want to read this one. So the scope uh, was to establish roadmaps towards uh, developing national LCA databases. It started with doing a baseline assessment, uh, stakeholder mapping and engagement, then a formation of a national database working group, and then roadmap development. And, there's a, and then the, the final activity are these uh, data-related activities, and that's when I come to the, that I mentioned earlier, this global LCA data. That's the last part, so I'll, I'll get to that. Just to give you an idea, it was a big international project consortium. It was led by um, EcoInvent Association out in Switzerland, and they make, um, have been the developers of, a, of kind of the largest international database, not international, national database, which was Switzerland, and uh, have been a global leader in uh, LCA data. So they won the tender um, when it went out with uh, putting together a consortium of which we at the University of Cape Town were I keep on using the wrong thing. Uh, we at the University of Cape Town were one of the, um, we're the South African partner, but there is a number of other countries, which was Brazil and Ecuador and India and Sri Lanka and Uganda. So we had um, every two weeks uh, Skype meetings where we shared experiences, which was interesting because Brazil already has a national uh, database, but it's sort of stalled in its development, whereas somebody like Uganda and um, Ecuador were really just really starting out on the early days of just in LCA capacity in general in their countries, whereas we in South Africa are quite similar to, to India and Sri Lanka in a way in that we've had research in LCA for some years, but we've never really managed to get it further than that out of the universities and into policy and into industry um, and that. So we shared experiences while we, we did our roadmaps and reviewed each other's roadmaps actually. So we didn't, so UCT was the, um, the, the project team there. That's myself and Professor Harry from Blotnitz uh, were there, but we worked with um, various life cycle, not necessarily life cycle experts, but let's say circular economy. We heard from um, Henry, Dr. Henry Roman this morning. We, uh, Peter Lukey is also looking at um, evidence-based, um, so the the affiliations are also old. I thought I'd write them as they were when we did the project, and uh, not as they are now. So the, the DST and the DIA uh, should indeed change. Um, I think the rest have all stayed the same. So we also had uh, Lee um, from NCPC. Uh, we had the Innovation Hub and some academic and then Green Cape. So we tried to, to get together a, a diverse, oh, and WWF representing um, civil society. So we wanted a, a, a diverse stakeholder group, but fairly small so that it could be quite focused on actually coming out with the roadmap. Missing there is industry. So when we did our stakeholder mapping, uh, we didn't get an industry partner that was um, willing to join the, the, the stakeholder or the database working group being fairly early stages, I guess, in LCA, they, you know, it's difficult to, to see the value but that certainly is a gap. This is rather long. So these slides are all very long and I am closing out to the end of my time. So I'm gonna really whiz through them, um, but mainly there is a link and I would really hope you would go and look at the roadmap for the detail on these slides. So rather we like the, the style of the, the UN, UNEA documents, they always start with this preamble. So we did the same, which is sort of noting why we need the, the database in South Africa, I think notably stuff I've mentioned earlier, but really that there's a strong alignment of the SDGs with South Africa's National Development Plan, the NDP, um, and that we need data to, to underpin uh, the evidence-based policy making to, to transition towards, to, SDGs and complementary to the to the NDP. Mm. 
This was the vision. So a South African national life cycle database is a repository of credible data sets, useful in evidence-based policy and decision-making, advancing sustainable development. So as in any roadmap, it's underpinned by the vision, and that's our vision, which was uh, hammered out with our, our database working group and then uh, put out to wider comment. And then after the vision, we needed to create the goals. So these are the three uh, goals for a South African national life cycle database to achieve that, that vision. Um, I'll read these out. Uh, so first of all, we had to be open access and transparent data for the public good, but for use with scientifically based life cycle impact assessment methods. So lots of debate, but there are countries where it's a, a not open access necessarily. So EcoInvent is, is one. The Swiss one, it is actually fairly expensive um, to buy it. You can get it for free. No, not actually only it's a non-OECD country, you can get it free for academic use, but even academia, you pay a fair amount to access the Swiss national database. But we felt that for value in South Africa, it really needed to be um, open access and for the public good. Our second goal was it needs to have environmental and social dimensions represented objectively for major products and services in the South African economy. And that is also fairly, um, I guess, ambitious, but also a novel in that life cycle assessment does tend to stick on the environmental side. But we were saying that for South Africa, not having a social dimension really doesn't, you know, there's, there's less justification for s such a data project if we didn't include the social dimension. Being critical for, actually for both the SDGs and especially for the, for the NDP where um, poverty eradication and social equity is one of the um, key drivers for, for growth and development. And the third goal is that it must be updated periodically as the nation's sustainability transition unfolds to assist with quantifying progress. So a challenge with, with life cycle databases is they can't be a static snapshot in time. It really needs to be updated continually um, at least every three to five years. So that's there as one of the goals. Following on from the goals, then we have objectives. And as I said, I'm not going to go through these files these slides um, totally, but I just wanted to highlight sort of in the document the things that we really lay out in a bit more detail, which is governance and management, uh, funds and financing, and then the human resourcing needs of a national database. So we have uh, further detail on that. Matching, uh, so each of the goals match to objectives. So those are the three goals, and then we matched specific objectives to, to each of those under those, and that was where I'd say for the roadmap project, we spent most of the time um, and effort in our workshops. So we had three workshops uh, with the database working group to, to hammer this out before we came up with the document. And it really, at an early stage, it's the governance and the management that really needed possibly the most uh, discussion. The next um, aspects that, that are considered in the roadmap are the more technical aspects, of, and these are um, sort of the, the database hosting and access, uh, data needs and availability, data quality and review, and then data format and uh, database interoperability. So those are the technical aspects, and we kind of felt that, well, whatever we do in South Africa, we would follow international best practice. So a lot of sort of the data format, which are big contentious issues maybe in a, in a technical field side of things, we would, as South Africa, as long as whatever we did was compatible with global best practice. So we thought, you know, it's more important to, to focus on the, the first aspects rather than on these more technical aspects. But they are there in the document as well, and there are objectives under each of those goals for those as well. What, I mean, the heart of a roadmap is implementation. Uh, so after we had done the goals and objectives, and discuss the sort of founding ideas. Um, we need an implementation plan. And it's critically where, of course, we sit with establish your founding partners. Um, and that's where we are at the moment. And very much I hope this process doesn't stall at the end of sort of the EU funding and a nice uh, document out there that, that lays out a possible path but it's really needing to find somebody to champion the roadmap 
and take it forward um, and to be the founding partners. So certainly from our, our database working group members, we're in discussion and really hope that there is um, somebody that will take it uh, further. Of course, alongside um, taking it further is this really critical secure funding. So, and this is the same for all of our countries, actually. It was all, yes, great, lots of interest, but who's going to fund this? So does the European Commission want to fund a follow-on project? You know, so they really funded this first step, but it's really without finding um, champions and funding partners. Um, but I think the, the project's been useful because it's laid out some concrete steps that certainly haven't been there before. We've had a couple of meetings, also funded by um, the UN, and the life cycle initiative. So I think there were a series of two to three meetings about a national database, but they don't ever really get further than, than the discussion. Now we have a document <laughs> that lays it out further, but really hope that it will catalyze that, that critical further action. So we had short-term activities, which are of course the most critical because if they don't happen, then nothing else happens. Then we had medium-term activities, uh, which were really around to one two got it going, once you've got a champion and a, and a starting group, you set up your, your, um, your structures for the database um, and appoint um, a manager, a steering committee, an expert committee. So those are all, you can read about those in the document, but that's sort of the, the governance structure that, that what we suggested. And then we have a longer term, which would be to actually get to the point where we're actually doing data projects, um, which would be great. So that's in the longer term, but really it all, comes down to, to the short-term activities. Sorry, Lee, I'm going very over. Can I have two more minutes? <laughs> because this project was done through the UN and um, Life Cycle Initiative, they have another initiative, which is called the Global LCA, I always get it wrong, GLAD. Let's call it the GLAD network. So it's where they're trying to set up this really, it sounded super ambitious when they first started it, but what they want to do is have a, a database um, a global system website where you can go and find all the LCA data, everyone contributes, and you can instantly find the data you need going to your right country. And for this, it's actually a very technical thing called interoperability, where data sets need to talk to each other because we're a global world, but we don't like to follow the same rules. So some people do data in this way, some people do another, another format, and um, database interoperability is all about, on a technical side, getting those to talk to each other. So because they also fund that, they wanted to put this project in a little bit with that project. Um, so one of our commitments was to, to put some data sets out there on GLAD, which ties in with another project um, we did with EcoInvent, uh, which was called the SRI project, which is a strange name um, called Sustainable Recycling Industries, even though the part that we were involved in had nothing to do with recycling per se, but it had to do with creating data sets uh, for South Africa. I've actually got a next slide on that, so I won't go into that too much, but what we did under that three project was develop some data sets for some key sectors of the South African economy. Um, and that involved a number of South African universities and organizations and, and was quite a big component of that project was um, training. So uh, NCPC was the co-host of that, co-manager of, of that, and they coordinated a number of training workshops as well as those, uh, some of the consultancies and universities that hadn't done a life cycle assessment before were creating those data sets. So it was good for capacity building, but it also came up with a number of really useful data sets that are all coming up in EcoInvent, because this was an EcoInvent, although it was actually funded by the Swiss, um, it's called SECO, the Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. They were uh, the funder of the project. It was done through the Swiss national database called EcoInvent with the rationale which is shown on this slide really. So as the Swiss database, which was Swiss, has really become quite a global database. It's the most widely used um, database within sort of the LCA globally. But they sit with this thing, and that's what this picture is showing, is that you know, all their data is up there in Europe, the little the dots corresponding to the number of data sets they have. I think they've got around 14,000 data sets, but they were really concentrated in Western Europe, which you would understand being a Swiss data set, database. But increasingly, there's the, the acknowledgement that, well, actually, the demand may be sitting in Europe, but the supply actually is coming less and less, um, you know, certainly on, on the resource side, you know, what's actually made in Switzerland is exceedingly small. 
So this three project funded by the by SECO was to build LCA expertise in developing in newly industrialized countries and create critical core LCI data, which then being an, an EcoInvent project actually is going into the EcoInvent database, which will be available in, in upcoming um, release of that. Not yet. Some of it's already in actually, but not but not all of it. So these are the, the sectors that were covered. Uh, nice colorful pictures falling off, but the sectors were sort of chosen to be particularly useful for, for South African life cycle studies, which is why we optimistically saying they form an, the nice seeds for a database, because they cover electricity and coal, which really come into just about any um, product life cycle you can think of. It will draw electricity. It's also really interest, useful for uh, just about all life cycles is fuel and transport, because there will inevitably be some sort of road freight transport, and either you're using fuel directly in your process or in your transport. A big component was cement and concrete that was done at the University of Johannesburg. They developed a whole bunch of, of um, building material data sets. Then there were some data sets on mining. Um, those were included because it's unique uh, things in South Africa, particularly uh, relevant for export. Agriculture, there are some data sets on, on agriculture. Those were the ones done within um, South Africa. And then there were some other three projects that weren't actually done by South African Institute, so there was no um, capacity building or learning on that side, but they did develop uh, data sets on South Africa. So there's a whole bunch of water supply data sets. And the waste disposal equally wasn't done specifically for South Africa, but what we did get in there, which has never been in before. It's always been Swiss databases, Swiss landfill, which is a beautifully managed landfill with leachate capture that then gets incinerated, which is not at all, of course, what happens on a South African landfill. So what is in the was done under this project was things to actually better um, enable us to model South African products, which was open burning and unsanitary landfill and open dumping. So. It was, you know, the, the, even those aren't specific for South Africa, they're for different, for different um, conditions and include the sort of the unmanaged uh, dumping of waste, which we've never had before. So those are the data sets. I've just put these up just to get the, ex the feel of the extent of them, because even though when we, you know, when we bid for these projects, they all turned out to be very much longer than we expected, because when you're doing product, they've each got these sub-products that ended up being done. So quite a, certainly for the, the building materials, all different um, MPA strengths of concrete. So it wasn't just one data set, it turned into a number of data sets. Um, so, and so for the transport, there's all different lorry sizes and different fuel standards. And that's the water ones. So although the sectors are such, the actual data sets are quite a large number, actually up to 80 of them, which is exciting to have those for South Africa, but frustrating for those who don't have the EcoInvent database. As I said, it is priced in euros, so pretty pricey for most um, users. So with this project, we're going to make a selection of those data sets available on, on this global LCA database network uh, free of charge, which is quite exciting, and that's from EcoInvent being involved in both projects. Just a little bit more about this GLAD platform. So there's its website address. You can go there and look. Uh, it's only in beta form at the moment, which is, I think, why uh, the Life Cycle Initiative wanted to use this project to try and push more data sets into GLAD. But the idea is to have this network of independently operated LCA databases and GLAD provides an interface for you to go and find the data that you need. And as I said, UN it's a UN environment um, project, project. Well, they're actually just the secretariat, and they actually get funding um, contributions, as they say, from various uh, governments around the world and also some contributions from private sector. So it's really a, a global um, thing where they are just the uh, secretariat. This is what it looks like. It's just a, a web interface, and you can go and search. Um, it's free of charge to get the data sets. What this is, though, it really is a, it's, one, it's like a hub. So if you find a data set, so now if you search and there's a data set for South Africa, it will bring up 
the database and just put you in touch with Eco and Rent to go and buy that data. If it's a paid for data, if it's free, it's available for download. So we've done at the end part of this project is to interface with how you technically you need to prepare your data to put up there, which has been quite challenging, which is, means we only have 24 of our data sets that are going up there, but there's quite a lot of work that needs to go behind um, and this actually getting them ready to put them onto GLAD. And we chose, hopefully, to give a nice selection from the three data sets to sort of uh, get the, the breadth out there. And these will be connected. They would really was hoping they would have been connected by now, and this talk would have been showing them and demonstrating them, but they are still under technical development on Eco and Ben's side. So they're still saying the end of 2019, which is getting less and less. So hopefully they'll be out soon. As I said, there's the link to the roadmap, um, or if you, here's my email address, if you drop me an email, I would be very happy to share it with you, uh, happy to receive comments on it, um, very happy if you'd want to join um, in some capacity, be a partner, take it forward. We are planning to have a webinar when the GLAD datasets do eventually go live so that we could um, demonstrate how to use them, how to download them and navigate through them, and we will do that. So if you would like to be informed of that also, please drop me an email. And that's it. Sorry, I did go quite a lot over time, but thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers for uh, sharing with us quite some important information. Um, I think one of the things that we always, always mention in NCPC is that if you can't measure it, you can't change it. And um, for us to understand and know the extent of the impact that we have on the environment, um, it becomes critical to actually have um, quantified and verified data to, to have the true reflection of what we are doing and what we need to do. Um, so thank you again to our speakers. Um, I do realize that we've come to the end of the day. Um, I want to not drag the session much longer, um, but if there's any burning question, um, I'm going to give the opportunity for one burning question. Um, if there's not, um, please uh, join us for some tea. We're ending off the session today, the first conference uh, day with uh, some tea. Um, there's also a, what we call a demo rig fan system um, that's being uh, um, showcased in the, in the exhibition area. So please feel free to go and see what, they, what the energy guys are doing there. And I'm hoping that our speakers would stick around if there's any questions, um, but I would like to thank everyone for staying, um, you know, for being here and being uh, attentive and staying connected. Um, and once again, thank you to our speakers for, for sharing with us all the important information. Um, thank you, and uh, please join us again tomorrow for um, uh, dealing with... Um, industrial symbiosis, um, and we will um, share some more case studies on what we've been doing in that front. Thank you.